clock up there says either 20 to 9 or 4 to 8. I can't tell for sure, but I think we'll go by my watch. A lot of things to kind of get through this morning. First of all, I found this on the altar. I don't know whether we're supposed to rejoice about the birds or whether we're supposed to pray for them. But in either case, we'll put it back where I found it. Look at the announcements in your bulletin and then I have a number of other ones. First of all, if you're not using these shoebox envelopes that come in your bulletin week after week, please leave them in the pew because we'll just pick them up and use them for next year. So, and as Bill McCall said this morning, if you want, you can fill them up. Um, our Sunday school class, we're just finishing a video series from Chip Ingram on what is heaven like, and if you missed it, you missed a good one. The next one coming up starts in two weeks, and it's entitled Life's Demands. And I think that will be a very good one in terms of balancing demands, what are demands, etc. So if you want to join us, we usually get started just right around 10 minutes to uh, 5 minutes till 10. So come join us. We still have some empty seats. I have another one here that has to do with the, um, the fall gathering that they do uh, jointly. The ladies of First Presbyterian Church in Greenville would like to extend an invitation to an evening of dessert and coffee and conversation on October 24th at 6.30. We would usually have a soup and salad supper at this time of the year, but we're we'll having to rethink what we are capable of doing. Because we look forward to the fellowship we share at our gatherings, we thought dessert would be doable for this time. Hopefully we can try something else next time. So here's the plan. Dessert, coffee and tea, October 24th, which would be next Saturday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, First Presbyterian Church in Greenville, a discussion about advice. What's the best advice you've been given? What's the best advice you've given to someone else? And what godly advice do you find in the Proverbs? We need to re-SBRP re with the number attending, and we need to get that in to Mary by Wednesday, correct? So if you want to join that evening, which will be a good evening, let Mary know by Wednesday so she can let them know. And then the following Tuesday, I'm guessing we'll have carpooling if we need to. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to start sending the clipboard around. Stop. Can you grab that, please? If you were going to sign up for the bazaar, you're too late. Unless you want to show up tomorrow morning and help pack. What time are we packing, Don? Around 9 o'clock. Okay, speaking of the bazaar, how did we do? I just want to say a huge thank you. It takes a team to put on an event like that, the bazaar. And we raised over $2,200 yesterday at the bazaar. We reached out to the community. We had people here from Carnes City even, drove all the way up here for our bazaar. They, they saw it on Facebook because we posted it out there. And we had hundreds and hundreds of people here yesterday. And we were busy nonstop the whole time. There's still lots left over there and some baked goods left, but we raised over 2,200 and still counting for Common Grounds in Mercer. So a huge thank you. I mean, it's, it's not a one-man job, it's not a two-man job. It took this whole congregation and extras to get that done. So appreciate it and thank you very much. I think Ned deserves a round of applause. I think there's enough. We can have a bazaar next week too, right? Yeah, we have enough left. And I gotta tell you what, 
I went home, I was heading out of here yesterday, and the FedEx truck was backing out of our driveway. And I said, look, there's stuff for the bazaar in the six years from now. <laughs> and, and truthfully, I was cleaning out some drawers yesterday, and I have seed for next year already. <laughs> amazing you know what, we works. were just talking about that this morning in our Sunday school class. Oh yeah. How we work to gain things, collect things, and then they don't fill our need. We think they'll fulfill us, and they only last for a few days. Or sometimes it's just our in-laws give us stuff and we feel guilty about getting rid of them. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> just say. All right, look at the announcements there. There's a lot of them. If you want to get your soup uh, <coughs> reservation in or order in, when's the deadline, Rosina? Next, Next Sunday? Next Sunday. So get your order in for that. Backpack team is packing on Monday the 30th, and we can always use a little bit of help from that. Uh, the the uh, clipboard's going on. Speaking of the clipboard, there's lots and lots of openings for lay leaders. And if you think you can't do it, here's two things you need to be able to do. Say good morning and read. Because every single, every single word that you need to do is written out here for you. So don't think you can't do it and give it a try. Try it once and if it's not for you, at least you tried. Any other announcements that aren't on here? By the way, the lay leaders, what Linda's doing, in case you didn't know what that was. Yes. It's churchy words, you know? Yep. Hey, another announcement too. Uh, in the back in the vestibule, or another big churchy word, narthex. Um, we have uh, these. I printed out some of these articles for you. It's called "Biblical Parallels to Israel, Israel uh, Tragedies Call for Lamentation," uh, and with all that is going on over there right now, uh, and as it threatens to become a global issue, um, just I, I share this with you. There's a lot of scripture reference things to help guide us uh, in our prayer life concerning these things uh, and to help to see this not from what whatever news media you watch or what you read but what does what do you read in the Bible how does the Bible inform us as Christians uh, to be faithful in such times as this so uh, I would encourage you to pick up a copy if we run out let us know we'll get you another one I got a couple up here uh, we can always print more up so that's out there Sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. That's a good announcement. I'm hoping there's still one there when I get there. Any other announcements? If not, Cheryl, would you give us the prelude this morning? In times such as these, we join the psalmist with our groans of grief and burdens laid down, lay them down for the next hour. As we come to the Lord this holy day, this holy day we can bring all of the troubles of the week, the neighborhood, our world, and even that which happens in our homes, and give them to the Lord our God and breathe deep the Holy Spirit. And so we read this 23rd Psalm with familiar tones, soothing even. As we breathe, let us be grateful and praise our God, our shepherd. <coughs> Responsive call to worship. Would you stand if you're able? The Lord leads us like a shepherd. God nourishes our lives and restores our souls. The Lord is with us, even in the darkest valley. God's goodness and mercy are always with us. Let us sing praises. Unto God. The hymn is I Must Tell Jesus, number 
ago with necrosis of the pancreas. He's in the mid 30s and um, it is now suffocating his organs mm -hmm. and his livers being compromised. So if you could please keep Justin. Justin? In yes, prayer. we pray for Justin. Well, it's on. Todd, sorry. Uh, my daughter Megan and her family, please. Okay, Megan. You got it. Yep. Sandy. I need to keep praying for Peggy Tate. Peggy? She's been suffering with shingles for oh. over a month. I just talked to her every day. I'm not getting any better. Oh, that's awful.
is where the young football player mm -hmm. was seriously injured. And they said that it's still really touch and go with him. They were asking for prayers for him, but also his mother. His mother is on hospice care. Oh, okay. So this family is I guess she had cancer, but yeah. needing a lot of prayers. And they asked yesterday at the bazaar if we could remember that family. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Hey, Becky. Um, prayers for Erica. Back in the spring, she was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, and everything seemed to be pointing towards lupus. And at one point, we thought she had a rare blood disorder. Mm -hmm. And a couple weeks ago, her heart's been racing. I took her to emergency room, and now we found out that she has some heart issues, and I don't know if that's lupus related. COVID related, she's supposed to be on um, high priority to get mm -hmm. a culture heart monitor to wear and also to see a cardiologist. But oh, wow. It's been over a week and we still have a heard. Come oh, on. Okay. We'll keep Erica in our purse for sure. And I, I guess some clarity for, there. for a CAT scan to check on my kidneys then and see what's up. Yeah. Still there, huh? Yay. As long as they just stay put, it's all good, right? Well. <laughs> I'm anxious to see here, if you, if, you, if you have troubles with yours, is it worse having that than childbirth? Because you figured you've done both, so. Oh, uh, it's about pretty much the same. Yeah, see, they told me that when I had mine, it's worse having a kidney stone. I'm like, I don't want to be in the contest. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, Becky, we will keep you in our prayers as well. Anything else? Yes, I want to thank God for this church and all the people who live in it. Amen. Sounds like that's a good thing to be thankful for. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I prepared this, this prayer today that I offer. As maybe some of you are this week and with after last Sunday, when last Sunday I announced about you know the news in Israel, and I just had I didn't know a whole lot about it at that point. And of course, through the week we've learned much more. And it's been interesting to me watching, and we've talked about this before. When you have various news sources, and they often come with their agendas. Every news station has its own agenda. I mean, because it's owned and run by corporations made of people. And, and so, and we all pick which ones we expose ourselves to. It's no big secret, right? And, and I was struck by how uh, some will play the protests from college campuses and stuff. And others don't show you everything that's going on, and some do, and all the, all the various things. And it brought to mind... You know, years and years ago, I can remember my grandmother, my mom's mom, who's no longer with us, of course, but I can remember she could not possibly, she would not believe that the Holocaust happened because she refused to believe that human beings could be that evil to one another. And she completely denied it, that it was just a big hoax, that it was all made up. And it's fascinating to me how it seems like History is repeating itself. And there are those that will refuse to believe or deny that such things are happening. And the fact of the matter is, in this past week, more Jews have died from evil and violence than, or not, it's the worst since the Holocaust. I'm sorry, let me put that right. It's, this is the worst since then. Here we go again. And so I offer this prayer to help us, hopefully, to give you, maybe some of you have struggled with what I've struggled with. This has been a theme of, I think, my ministry since ever since I started out, because I was doing pulpit supply when 9-11 happened. And I desperately sought, to, how, do, how do you know how to pray? What do you pray for? And it seems like in, in, in the God's Word we get conflicting messages, you know, depending on what you read and stuff. So, 
I hope this helps you and blesses you, and, and you can pray and as you wish in this situation, because I'm sure we all have various opinions and thoughts and certainly emotions. Why don't we trust in the Lord? Let's pray. Great God, in you is more love than we can imagine. More grace than we can even fathom. You've shown yourself in Jesus Christ as a God who meets us where we are and loves us as we are. We're glad for this day and we're grateful for so many gifts you grant us. You bring good things into our lives, more than we can name, more than we can number. And you give us the bread of life, you sustain our souls, you feed us, you feed our deepest hungers. And you accompany us along the way. Thank you. Thank you for your abundant faithfulness. Our hearts, we, we come this morning with our hearts full of many things today. Some that we know, loved ones, even some here maybe, we struggle with disease. Some face death, pain, sorrow. These are things that are constantly among us. The journey through these days, it's marked by uncertainty, heartache. We're frequently, frequently overwhelmed by the needs around us and within us. Some need healing, some need encouragement, some need comfort, some need assurance. We all need hope. So we turn to you, asking you to hear our prayers and grant what we need for the living of these days. So we lift up to you, Justin. We, we ask for prayer for Megan and, and her family. For Peggy, for Jackie. We pray for Becky and Erica and, and this family that we don't even know from Carn City and, and all that's going on there. We ask that you would meet their needs. And remind us to pray throughout this day and the week for this list and the more that are on our minds, I'm sure. And today we, we come with a diverse sense of pain, heartache, shock, anger, rage. Literally a plethora of feelings as we watch with horror the atrocities committed against our brothers and sisters in Israel. Jew, Christian, Muslim alike. Some of us cry. Some of us are just flat out furious. And everything in between. And we wonder, Lord, how do we faithfully pray in times such as these? We want to pray for peace. That's what we're taught. We, we pray for love and for hope. Yet, truthfully, some of us want Hamas and others who commit such inhuman atrocities, we want them to pay. We want them to be blotted out, to be pushed into the, into the sea. Lord God, we give, us our hon we give you our honesty. Our hearts are open to you. Turn our anger and our rage into helpful service and care as you lead us and as you call us. We hear your word concerning such things and we wonder at its meaning and its application today. Lord God, you, you've gifted us with so many things, so many positive and uplifting things from the psalmist, and yet there are things such as these that the psalmist writes. He writes, give to them according to their work and according to their evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. And Lord, the psalmist goes on to say that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. Lord, we can sit here and read this and we can say, sounds about right. In Deuteronomy, you state, vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. 
And yet, Lord, we are a New Testament people and we read in the Bible in, in the New Testament where your son Jesus teaches us to love people, to turn the other cheek. And the Apostle Paul writes to us, the beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God for his written vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so, Lord, Lord, we place our prayers at your feet. That we acknowledge that if you call your people Israel, if you call, if you're, you're, if you seek vengeance by raise up, raising up an army as it seems to be, then we entrust them to you. And we pray for your soldiers that they would carry out your vengeance. That they would do it with mercy and swiftness without malice. But we do pray. We do pray for a quick remedy to war. We pray for those Christians and innocent civilians that are caught in the crossfire, that are used as human shields in Gaza. We pray for the, the innocent in Israel. And folks that are folks that are just at the wrong place at the wrong time as wrath falls upon their cities and homes. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on those caught in the crossfire. Lord God, hear this prayer. And may, may your word be a light to our feet. And may if we take nothing else from your word and how we're taught to pray, that we would just trust you with it. Give it all into your hands. For we do know, even though we sometimes wonder, we do know that your hand is upon it all. So hear us and give us a calm spirit as we affirm our faith in you, our protector, our almighty. Amen. Friends, would you, would you join with me? And maybe we can find some comfort by remembering what it is we believe. Would you... Read with me the affirmation of faith in your bulletin and on the screen, and join with me. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. It is with a grateful heart that I call you who are grateful, grateful for God's faithfulness and thanksgiving for all that we have received from Him in this week and in our lives. Let us then bring our gifts to our God with our offering.
to the service here in, in this church, in this place, in this time, for all those that help with the, the bazaar. And we just pray, Lord, that this offering and that the offering through the bazaar would be used to glorify your kingdom, to witness Christ in this world that is in much need of the peace and the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One nice thing, I guess, that so far that's come out of all that's been going on in Israel, that some of the folks that, um, that I've had the pleasure of meeting and know uh, and contacts with folks, uh, both, both, uh, Israeli and Palestinian, no one has been affected personally yet um, of the folks that I'm aware of uh, that are there, um, but that could all change, we know. Hmm. Well, our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 25 to 36, and the Gospel of Luke 15, 17 to 24. Let us pray for illumination in the reading and proclamation of God's word. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We enter into this reading in the Gospel of John about John the Baptist. As he's already met Jesus and Jesus' uh, baptism. And he continues on in his, his disciples, the people that are following John the Baptist. And they're along the river prior to their entry uh, of, of Jesus really coming on the scenes here much more. And, and in this time, anyways, there's a lot of questioning and grumbling and, and debate going on. And so John is, is confronted. And I let's just pick up the story here and Leave it to God's word to do the talking. John 3, beginning with verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. 
For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now tune into this. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the Christ has come, and his name's Jesus, and he has the keys to heaven, and he's inserting them into the lock all the time, and the door is always being open. At the moment we hear the word of God and we accept it in belief, the door of heaven is open to us. Every time we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, he pulls out his keys, and he gets ready to open the door. But the awful truth is that every time those who do not know Jesus and turn their back on our testimony, the door slams shut and the keys to heaven go back in Jesus' pocket. The good news is today that for those who believe and who repent, us, hip, uh, us repentant hypocrites, every time we believe, every, when we are walking in faith, we are enlisted by Jesus to help him open the door of heaven. For the moment one believes or repents from their hypocrisy, the keys come out and the door of heaven is opened and the celebration begins. But I know, some of us struggle more than others to have the faith to share our faith. Some may have even grown up with a generation or so ago being taught, well, faith is a private matter. You don't share that. And that was a terrible teaching. It's not true. And when you consider the idea of sharing your faith with somebody, it scares the you-know-what out of you, right? I understand that. Maybe, you know, and, and i got to tell you, if you refuse to share your faith with somebody, be careful. God has this mischievous way of putting you in particular in a place where you're going to have to do it. Oh, you can choose not to, but beware. If you are in a position to share your faith with somebody and you flat out refuse to do it, you are as much as turning your back on Christ. And that ain't good. We struggle with sharing our faith, though, if we're honest. It's, it's, it doesn't come natural to a lot of us. But you think about it, if you don't do it, who will? If we don't obey Jesus Christ by going and making disciples of all people and baptizing them, the Great Commission, who will? And on top of that, if we're not obeying Jesus, is the door shut to us? Are you, well, I, mean, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, are you coming to church on Sunday, but living by the world the rest of the week? Are you coming to church to be entertained? Because, you know, you're a wacky preacher, you never know what I'm going to say. Or, or are you coming to church because you got something you got to protect? Or... Yeah, well, anyways. Are you saying you're a member of this church, but not willing to witness Jesus in your everyday life? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. I hope not. I truly hope not. There's an old theological term that we don't hear much about these days, and I can't say I... I I've gone back through my memory bank, and I do not remember hearing about this in seminary. The office of keys. The office of keys. Maybe, I don't know that anybody here is old enough to remember when they used to teach this. What in the world is the office of keys? It's not the little lockbox in the office where we keep the spare keys. Right? And by the looks of the people that would come through here all hours of the day and night and bring their stuff for the bazaar, 
I think half of Mercer County has a key to this place. It's bizarre. Ooh, wait, I didn't, no pun intended. Anyway, the office of keys. The keys are the gospel and obedience to Jesus Christ. The keys open heaven to believers and it is, un and it is, wait a minute, the keys to heaven open to believers and it is locked to unbelievers. The good news is the kingdom of heaven is open when it is proclaimed and openly testified to by believers according to the command of Christ that as often as they accept the promise of the gospel with true faith, all their sins are forgiven by God for the sake of Christ's gracious work. The bad news the wrath of God and eternal condemnation fall upon all unbelievers and hypocrites as long as they do not repent. You know, they don't turn around. God will judge the one and the other in this life and in the life to come. So as a pastor, I certainly have the responsibility as a good steward of the keys to proclaim the good news and seek obedience and teach it to you all. And hold you all accountable to being doing these things, sharing the good news, being obedient to Jesus Christ, not to me, to Jesus. To constantly be encouraging you and teaching you. And then we have that responsibility to each other. And I'm sure for our Sunday school folks and those of you that study your Bible, you, you probably know a little something about how the Jews of the Old Testament those, like the one guy that was there following John the Baptist, and it, that would follow Jesus and ask him questions, they were very concerned about all the laws of Moses. And, and a lot of Jews to this day are very concerned about the law of Moses and upholding all the laws. And there's all kinds of things. And they were so overly concerned about the rules and the laws governing the way they walked and lived for Yahweh. They would not yet heard or understood Paul's words that, that, that we know about being saved by grace through faith. They didn't get that yet. And they were consumed by the need to check off all the boxes concerning the law. Do I, did I do this? Did I not do that? Oh no, I messed up. I got to go back and wash my hands 50 times and start all over again. That would happen. But the problem was, and Jesus would teach about this, is a lot of times while they were going through the ritual, they would push the hungry and the poor out of the way or step on them along the way to the bathhouse to clean their hands. Totally missing the point, right? They had not yet heard, they did not yet understand that we are saved by grace through faith. John the Baptist delivered the first good news message for all the hypocrites when he said, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So if you believe in Jesus, the keys open heaven's door. With that belief comes obedience. Thus John's words that if one does not obey Jesus, the wrath of God remains on him. In other words, the door closes with a big old bang. Look at it this way. I think it's interesting they use that our, our, the fathers of the faith choose this keys to heaven thing uh, and, the, and this whole idea of the door. And, you know, think about it in your own experience. When, when you open a door, is it a bad thing? I mean, usually when I, you know, if you're celebrating, if you're in a good mood and you come home from, and it's been a good day at work, you got the promotion or a bonus, you swing the door open and go, I'm home, and you're happy, right? And at least the dog's thrilled to see you, right? But, but when you close a door, I mean, it's not like when you close the door, you slam the door shut and go, I'm home, as you're leaving. That doesn't make any sense at all. To, you think about it, the opening of door is typically, typically a good thing, a positive thing. The closing of a door is usually seen as a negative thing, right? When we get angry, we don't softly close the door, do we? Usually when somebody's angry, they slam the door. Kind of like put the exclamation point on something, right? 
the opening of the door. The opening of the door to heaven. It's a good thing. It's a blessing. It's the good news. But the closing of the door, not so good news. But that can change. So anyways. Those with a pure heart. And how do we get a pure heart? Belief in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Thus we are redeemed to live for him. And heaven is opened to us. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Right? The pure in heart believe in Jesus and obey him. Obedience to Jesus means loving people enough to share the faith with them. Obedience means going by any means possible and loving on people in order that they might be saved. And sometimes, obedience to Jesus Christ means, sometimes it means confronting a brother or sister who are in living a life of disobedience to Jesus. And nobody wants to talk about that, and most of us preacher types don't even like to talk about that. The kingdom of heaven is open when the good news is proclaimed and openly testified to believers, one and all, according to the command of Christ. Your witness to the gospel is obedience to Jesus. But, it, you know, so our witness should be the opening of a door to a new life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. I mean, that's, that's the best news ever. But whoever does, does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Doors are made to be closed, right? The kingdom of heaven is closed by disobedience and the refusal to believe in Jesus. And I, I think we're big kids. I think we get the part about refusing the good, new, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what of the hypocrites to whom it's closed to? First of all, let me ex explain something if I haven't explained it before. And I know the, these are these words might be uh, what do they call it now? Not triggered. What's the word when you say something and it somebody might get upset? Huh? Huh? Politically correct. Politically, yeah. But there's another. Um, is it trigger? Is that what is the word? Anyways. Inflammatory. Inflammatory. Nah, that's not what I'm looking for. Anyways, it's a popular word they use. Yeah. Offended. Triggers that too. <laughs> that's but you get a, you get the message. You know, the, the keys to the kingdom of heaven are exclusive, right? Meaning you have to believe in Jesus to get into heaven. So it's an exclusive, it's a kind of a members only club, right? It's a private club in that way. But the, good news, the message of the good news of the gospel is inclusive to everyone. The, Jesus was crucified to forgive the sins of the world. That anybody that believes in him can come to him. But only the ones that believe. So we are, you know, it's inclusive, but exclusive. Right? So I hope I didn't trigger anybody or hurt anybody by that. But it's, it's the truth. It's God's word. Sorry. So anyways. Uh, what does a hypocrite look like in the church? Well, if you believe in Jesus, but you don't trust him, you might be a hypocrite. If you come to church only to find fault with somebody else, you might be a hypocrite. If you claim to love Jesus, but don't love his children, I'd say you are a hypocrite. Repent. That's the cure. Just turn around. Stop doing that stuff. Do the opposite. Pray for Jesus to help change your heart, to redeem your disobedience. And if you have, and if you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm perfect, I'm not a hypocrite at all. Best get your mirror out and ask the Lord to reveal to you the truth. Okay? And when you do, we will celebrate with the sounds of the keys rattling in heaven. And that's isn't that the story of the prodigal son? You know, he went out lived the high life, insulted his dad terribly by insisting on getting his inheritance before his old man kicked off. Then he goes off and blows it on on wild, wild women and booze and rock and roll, I don't know, whatever. Blows it all 
And he winds up feeding pigs for somebody and hoping to get the scraps that the pigs don't eat. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had a pig or raised a pig, but pigs are like walking garbage cans. They'll eat just about every, anything. I don't understand the old, the old thing about goats eating anything. No, goats are actually picky eaters, I understand. But pigs, they'll eat anything. Any, well, anyway. So this poor guy, well, let's go see what, how's the story end here? So this picks up, the story picks up where, where uh, the prodigal gets his head right. Let's see what happens. And he said, I am beginning with verse, or, oh, verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This too is the word of the Lord. I don't know about all you, but I love a good barbecue. And that's what they were getting ready to do. Have a big old party. Because this son, who was basically dead to his father, is alive. He's come to his senses. He's repented. He's confessed his sin and asked for forgiveness. And this father, like our Holy Father doesn't even hold it against him, doesn't even, doesn't even do it, doesn't even give him an I told you so. Right? Like a lot of us would probably do. Christ commanded that those who hear the Christian, that, who bear the Christian name in an unchristian way, us hypocrites, either in doctrine or in life, should be given brotherly admonition, that we should be straightened out so we can repent. And there can be a celebration then. But if you don't, the door slams harshly. But remember, the prodigal son. Christian discipline is all about, it's not about pointing the finger at somebody. It's not about kicking somebody out of the church. It's about bringing them in. Discipline. Insisting on obedience to Christ is all about bringing the family together and getting us whole again. It's not about casting somebody out what you do when you love people we don't if you love your children you don't let them get away with murder and keep on doing stupid stuff until they wind up destroying themselves no you correct them you give them the tools to succeed you lift them up you encourage them sometimes you encourage them with a pat on the backside right and sometimes with a big old hug and share tears this is what God does with us and what we're called to do with one another Anyway, I love a party. I love open doors, especially when they're in heaven, huh? To assure our part in the open door policy of Jesus, may we always, always proclaim the good news to all people. We are to call one another into obedience, and when one repents, we'll celebrate and praise our Father in heaven for his grace. Believe and obey and the doors of heaven will be open to you. These are the keys to heaven. Belief in Jesus and obedience to him. May we all heed this warning and the good news from God's word. Amen. Why don't we sing together this old, old hymn, Jesus Call Us Over the Tumult. Number 375, if you're using your hymnal course on the screen.
from this place trusting that God is with us and for us in every place. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.